Good morning from, from Washington to our, and welcome to our program today, our webinar entitled Iran, Russia, and China in the post-US withdrawal Afghan landscape. There's much go discussion going on on the implications of the US decision to withdraw its forces from Afghanistan. Most of that discussion is devoted to its impact on the course of the Afghan conflict and particularly on the survival of the regime. In this morning's panel discussion, we're going to employ a broader lens, hoping to understand its meaning for the political dynamics of the region. We will be particularly focused on Iran, Russia, China, although also concerned with the Central Asian states. Our interest is on how developments in Afghanistan affect these countries, but also on the role they may play in determining the outcome in Afghanistan. Additionally, and importantly, we will be asking how the relations among the countries are being impacted and by what is, by what is happening in Afghanistan. Now, first, about the format, uh, there'll be some brief opening remarks by our panelists. I will follow that up with some questions and then we will entertain questions from you, the viewers. To submit your questions, please use Zoom's Q&A feature, which you can find on your screens. For those calling in by phone or watching our panel live stream, you can ask a question by emailing events at nai.edu. If you have any technical issues, please also use events at nai.edu. Feel free to raise questions at any time throughout the panel, and I'll be looking at all the questions and we'll bring in as many as possible during the discussion over this hour. So now, to introduce our speakers. First, Fatima Aman is a non-resident senior fellow at the Middle East Institute, who has written on Iranian, Afghan, and broader Middle Eastern affairs over a period of 20 years. She'll be followed by Nikita Menkovich, is an expert at the Center for Modern Afghanistan Studies and, Russian in, and the Russian International Affairs Council. He has written a number of works on the economy and international politics of the Middle East and Transcaucasian region. Mustafa Sawar is a Prague-based broadcaster and journalist with Radio Azad, Radio Free Europe's Radio Liberties. Afghanistan service. He began working with Radio Azad in Kabul in 2002 and joined the main headquarters, I believe in Prague, in 2005. Finally then, Reed, Reed Standish is a correspondent with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, focused on China in Eurasia. He previously worked for Foreign Policy Magazine in Washington and Moscow. I am Marvin Weinbaum. I'm the director of Middle East Institute's program in Afghanistan and Pakistan studies. So let's begin then, and let's begin with Fatima. Please. Fatima, you're, you're, you're muted. Yes. OK. Thank you very much for uh, including me in this very timely event with, with some of the really great experts. Um, let me start with my conclusion that as we were talking before, there are not many options left for Afghanistan and uh, the uh, worst case scenario is not that the gap created by the US withdrawal will be filled by a state or a regional country, but by foreign uh, insurgent groups and by a civil war to follow. Uh, 
So uh, it has to be acted now uh, for uh, in regard of any outcome, any any res you know res uh, result. I will briefly touch upon the planned withdrawal and the position of Afghanistan's neighbors. Uh, we'll discuss uh, some possible outcomes and talk about Tajikistan as perhaps an, a, a very I mean, especially important factor uh, in regard to any outcome uh, of Afghanistan's future. There is a country, uh, you know, uh, the, Tajikistan is a country that uh, very important to Afghanistan and all its neighbors, are, as I'm sure uh, other colleagues will also uh, discuss uh, Central Asia and, and Tajikistan. A lasting, a lasting peace in Afghanistan may not be possible without the active participation of its neighbors and regional players due to two very important factors. One that Afghanistan, uh, you know, has a heavily tribal structure. And the other one is that Afghanistan is located in a region uh, filled with rivalries in, uh, you know, India, Pakistan, India, China, uh, Russia, United States, uh, United States, Iran, Iran, Saudis, uh, and uh, in addition, each player, you know, has uh, a, a, its own uh, uh, sphere of influence in, in different parts of Afghanistan. Um, let me uh, briefly uh, review each of the reg regional players, starting with, uh, you know, one of Afghanistan's immediate neighbors, Iran. Iran's main concern at this point in Afghanistan is security. It has a genuine concern that if Afghanistan turned into a civil war, it could spill over into Iran's territories. Uh, this concern has made Iran to bring, you know, Taliban delegations uh, frequently to Iran. The worst case scenario for Iran is that Afghanistan becomes a haven for, for international uh, terror groups. Uh, terrorist groups and uh, you know um, the group, terrorist groups both from the Middle East and from uh, Central and South Asia so uh, uh, counting on the differences within the Taliban factions uh, Iran hopes uh, to build its uh, you know a closer relations with with several factions of the Taliban and I think they have managed to do that uh, uh, Iran's other concern are uh, narcotics. You know, uh, uh, Iran is the main route of uh, uh, narcotics produced in Afghanistan to Europe and the rest of the world. With four million drug addicts uh, in Iran, its addiction is becoming a number one, has become actually a number one uh, social issue. And there is also concern of flow of migrants and refugees into Iran uh, should a civil war break in, uh, you know, in Afghanistan. There is also an old water dispute between Iran and Afghanistan, uh, the transboundary water of Helmand. Afghans call it Helmand, Iranian calls it Hirman. But at this point, those challenges are of lesser urgency than, you know, a, a ISK or Islamic State Khorasan groups like uh, taking over neighboring country. For uh, Central Asia, uh, as uh, colleagues will uh, talk, you know, uh, broadly, they, uh, they are, you know, the attention, I think all of Afghanistan's neighbors are going to focus their attentions on the Central Asian uh, Tajikistan. Uh, Kunduz, for instance, Afghanistan Kunduz is a gateway to uh, to Central Asia and a you know has been emerging point of uh, you know different uh, extremist groups. Today, Tajikistan is facing with challenges such as uh, border security. Uh, uh, you know, underdeveloped health system, extremism, narcotics, uh, and it's perhaps one of the poorest countries in the world. And any impact of Afghanistan in Afghanistan would also, any development in Afghanistan would impact Tajikistan and vice, vice, uh, vice versa. Um, so uh, for, uh, you know, Central Asian countries, a complete U.S. withdrawal uh, pose uh, 
both economic consequences and uh, more security challenges. For Russia, as uh, will also be discussed, uh, main concern is that, uh, you know, Taji, uh, uh, basically uh, a civil war in Afghanistan would involve uh, uh, Russia's uh, Central Asian neighbors, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. For China, uh, is, you know, Afghanistan is a critical spot uh, 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 as uh, it neighbors Tajikistan one of the most important Central Asian uh, countries for the BRI, uh, you know, giant, massive uh, strategic project of uh, Belt and Road Initiative. For India, I know I, uh, we will uh, definitely discuss that as well. Uh, I think, you know, India's primary concerns in Afghanistan uh, are security related and its focus has always, has mainly been on increasing uh, is soft power, but with uh, changing Afghanistan's landscape so rapidly, I think there is no uh, India. Uh, in India's only choice will be uh, to get more involved. And a meeting with the Taliban they had this week, uh, early this week. So uh, let me conclude by saying that the Taliban is uh, in control uh, of almost half of the country, and you know they seem to be advancing. The uh, Taliban uh, know by now that the United States and the West will not deploy forces into Afghanistan uh, the way it was done in the past. Uh, they feel in such a strong position, the Taliban, that they, you know, they are threatening countries uh, not to provide the United States with a military base, with military bases in uh, different places. However, you know, it is crucial that financial and uh, uh, military and mostly financial help uh, for Afghanistan into Afghanistan will continue uh, at least for some time. And it is important that the Afghans are not left at the mercy of the, of the Taliban. You know, uh, establishing a relationship with the uh, with the Taliban and broad regional involvement in Afghanistan seem to be the only way to make the Taliban accountable in dealing with people of Afghanistan. And uh, we, if we get if I get a chance, we can also talk about uh, you know some sort of uh, regional peacekeeping force uh, that could involve all. Uh, regional, uh, you know, uh, players uh, and neighbors of Afghanistan. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Uh, Nikita, why don't you have your say? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really glad uh, to take part in this discussion on uh, co current events. Uh, uh, at first, I'd like to, uh, to say just a few words about the situation in Afghanistan itself. Uh, as far as I uh, know in this time, uh, Taliban do control nearly 70% uh, uh, of the territory of Afghanistan. Of course, not big cities. Of course, it's uh, um, uh, uh, not urban areas, but uh, the zone of Taliban control is uh, big and became more bigger. In, in this time, when we are talking here, as far as I know, uh, it is uh, clashes in uh, Kunduz city between the Taliban and government uh, troops. Um, uh, because uh, NATO and US troops is going to leave the uh, country soon, maybe, just maybe, I'm not sure, but it uh, may be, that we will see uh, Kunduz and Kabul fa uh, fall in Taliban hands uh, in this year. Uh, so, in fact, we are going uh, back, maybe to uh, 1992 or uh, 2001 time, when uh, Afghan country was under control of the terrorist groups. Uh, what are we going to do about it? I mean, not, not only Russia, but uh, other countries in the region and maybe outside. Uh, first of all, uh, we see that the uh, US and NATO did uh, lose the war. The war is lost. I'm sorry to say it, but it's, it is fact. 
so we see that uh, uh, 20 years of uh, the NATO troops in Afghanistan show that uh, NATO can't solve problems. It can only build a new one. Uh, it, uh, NATO and US failed to change the country, to make terrorists and uh, Taliban groups unacceptable uh, for uh, Afghan people. Now we see that uh, so-called Western values are unacceptable for un Afghan people, but Taliban values are acceptable. Of course, I myself don't like uh, this situation, but it, it is a fact. We can uh, change it uh, talking here. So uh, what uh, is going to be done uh, by Russia and uh, maybe China or Iran? In fact, we're going to uh, deal with uh, uh, security threats in the region, old and new one, without US, without NATO. We see it is ineffective and the only way to do something to defend ourselves is building of our own security network just to uh, secure the region, secure our interests. I don't think we are going uh, to come inside Afghanistan as it was before. Uh, we're just going to, to build um, a secure border around it. Of course, we are going to deal with any government we are going to have inside. If uh, Taliban is acceptable for uh, the Afghan people, we can't do anything about, the, uh, about that. We're going to have a dialogue with Taliban. In fact, uh, Tashkent, for example, do have diplomatic ties uh, uh, with uh, Talibs uh, in official way. They are uh, invited to uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Tashkent uh, so as an, um, an official part of Afghan um, I may, may I say a kind of Afghan government, maybe, Afghan representative. So, in Central Asia, we, are, uh, we were preparing for such situation for a long time. Uh, as you, you should know, uh, we do have a special um, regional treaty, uh, CSTO, including Russia and other regional countries, uh, to defend the region from uh, outside threats, including Afghanistan. Uh, in uh, this organization, we, uh, we build practices to, uh, to secure and to modernize uh, the border of Tajikistan and uh, the ways uh, of uh, cooperation with Uzbekistan in Turkmenistan. Uh, they are not um, members uh, of uh, uh, CSTO in this time, but uh, we do have a, a kind of a partner, we are going to have a kind of a partnership uh, 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 treaties as uh, NATO do have uh, with some countries where, uh, which are not members. Uh, of course, uh, in the same way, we're going uh, to build um, our ties with our countries, neighbors of the, uh, Afghanistan. For example, Pakistan and India. Uh, I remember that India do, do, doesn't have a border itself, but it's quite near from Afghanistan. And um, this country do have some problems with the terrorists from Afghan country. Uh, I think Pakistan and India will need uh, help, will need cooperation to secure them from Af uh, Afghan uh, uh, threat, from the threat of uh, terrorist groups, uh, not all Taliban, I mean, uh, Al-Qaeda and other groups as uh, IS. Uh, are quite active in Afghanistan now. Uh, so maybe they will ask for help uh, from Moscow or Beijing. Uh, they have no way just to do it. Of course, uh, Russia uh, and uh, China uh, is going um, uh, to continue cooperation in the Afghan field, in building uh, uh, with collective efforts uh, a secure border around the country. Of course, we are, we're looking uh, for ways to help the situation inside. Uh, uh, but it doesn't mean, I want to uh, underline it, it doesn't mean to, uh, Russia or uh, China troops inside. Maybe it's going to be uh, economical ties. For example, uh, we now discuss the possible uh, to build a, a railroad through Afghanistan to Pakistan. Uh, I mean, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan railroad project is uh, now uh, discussed. Maybe it uh, can be a kind of uh, humanitarian help. 
uh, of course, it's going to be uh, all kinds of um, uh, po political discussions uh, with uh, every new Afghan government. Maybe it's going to be a few Afghan government, not one, because I'm afraid that country is going to be broken after Taliban victory. Uh, in fact, uh, Taliban itself is going to be broken. As far as I know, Hakani network is going to split for the, um, from the Taliban and uh, build its own government. Uh, sorry for taking a long time, I'm just finishing. You see, the situation is complex. In fact, uh, a lot of us who live in the region did like when NATO uh, takes um, responsibility maybe um, about the situation in Afghanistan. But now we see NATO and US did nothing. And they can't uh, do anything uh, in this situation uh, in the future. So. Our future is in our hands. I mean, Central Asia countries, Russia, China, Pakistan, India, it is only our future, our security, and it is our problem. We are going to solve it uh, itself. If United States once will need um, such kind of help from us, we can provide it. Uh, it doesn't kind of joke. We, uh, we'll just see that our region is going up and NATO is falling down. The, uh, the organization did lose the war. So somebody is going to take responsibility for the world security instead of NATO. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nikita. Uh, let's, let's now uh, proceed uh, by asking, uh, uh, well, why don't, why don't I ask Reed? You go next, then. Reed, you want to uh, unmute yourself? Reed, can you hear me? Sorry, my <laughs> computer froze for a minute, but yeah, I can hear you now. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Um, so. Um, yeah, like, like you said, like Marvin had mentioned, um, my focus in my job, I work as a correspondent with, with Radio Free Europe and I'm focused on China. Um, in my position, I, I report broadly from Eastern Europe to South Asia. So obviously this part of the world falls within that. And then I also track this as part of a, a newsletter called China and Eurasia Briefing that I run that's, that's all about Chinese interests in this part of the world. So for my remarks, I'm going to try and talk specifically about China. Um, which I think is a more, you know, China's role in Afghanistan is a much more recent thing, especially if we look at, you know, who are the, the big kind of external players when, uh, when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan back in uh, following 9-11. Um, so if I can summarize how Beijing sees the situation in Afghanistan, uh, it's security, uh, specifically its own security. Um, China is growing increasingly concerned about a security vacuum emerging in Afghanistan. Um, and that situation looks increasingly dire with uh, you know, the Taliban making major advances. Um, and there are a lot of questions right now, I think happening internally within China and across the region about what kind of role uh, Beijing will play uh, moving forward. Uh, up until this point, uh, China's broadly pursued its interests in Afghanistan while relying on the U.S. presence to, to quell some of the more substantial security threats. Um, China's offered uh, limited support um, to the Afghan, the Tajik, and Pakistani border services. Um, and it also has a military outpost in Tajikistan along the, the Afghan border. Uh, but these efforts are quite single-mindedly focused on Chinese border concerns, and Beijing is hesitant about being drawn further into Afghanistan. Uh, which from any conversation I've ever had with anybody is internally seen as, you know, it's a quagmire that is best to be avoided is generally the, the Chinese policymaker point of view. Um, China shares a 76 kilometer border with Afghanistan, um, but Beijing's interests in Afghanistan are changing and evolving quite significantly, um, especially if we, we expand things out into the region, including in Central Asia and Pakistan. Um, when we compare that to the past. And I think that changes a lot of the calculus when we're looking ahead. Um, back in December, Afghan security forces broke up an alleged Chinese spy ring 
um, that was tracking down and hunting uh, Uyghur groups operating in Afghanistan. This is China's main focus of a lot of things. Uh, China's worried about Afghanistan becoming a haven for Uyghur radical groups who could potentially launch a cross-border insurgency. Although most analysts and people that I speak to see this as something that's increasingly unlikely, still this is Beijing's top concern and is the motivation behind a lot of its uh, you know, security footprint and activities uh, in the region. Uh, in economic terms, obviously we, we talk a lot about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is a you know, massive uh, investment infrastructure projects that have been happening globally. Uh, you know, when we look around Afghanistan, obviously we have, you know, Central Asia has been a big recipient of it. Tajikistan received a lot, Kazakhstan, uh, Pakistan, uh, CPEC, that is probably the, the flagship uh, kind of a project for BRI. Um, but actually, a lot of these things, integrating Afghanistan into that is, I mean, it's, it's largely frozen because of the security situation. Um, so China has, um, China's state-owned metallurgical group corporation. They secured a 3 billion 30-year concession in, back in 2008 to a huge copper deposit south of Kabul. And they've also um, secured oil and gas blocks in the north. But all these projects are basically at a standstill due to the security situation. Um, and I think largely any kind of connectivity plans that we can talk about I mean, the anything about integrating Afghanistan into CPEC, um, you know, further things of Belt and Road, uh, railway plans. I mean, these would be extremely difficult projects to execute if there wasn't a war going on. Um, if we look at the problems that Belt and Road and, and Chinese connectivity projects have experienced in Central Asia and South Asia, but let alone with the, the dire security situation, again, there are long-term perhaps ambitions and ideas but a lot of these things are, are in resting mode. They exist on paper. Um, diplomatically, Beijing is playing a much more active role than in the past. Uh, China has been engaging with the Taliban both directly and through Pakistan, uh, but also that relationship with the Taliban, I think is one that, that's quite tense. Um, and I think Beijing is not entirely comfortable with the Taliban. And I think there's also concerns about whether the Taliban would actually be willing to um, keep out Uyghur groups or to hand them over or to cooperate in, in finding them, which would be kind of a non-starter for Beijing and any type of arrangement they would reach with the Taliban. Um, you know, looking ahead, I would say, you know, China has zero ambition to replace the United States in, the Afghan in Afghanistan in any form. Um, but there are, you know, deep concerns about the government collapsing which is something that I believe the Wall Street Journal had a report, I think it was this week, you know, that that's the US intelligence community assessment that basically six months after a US pullout, they would expect the, the government to collapse. Um, so that means that China needs to do things that it's not comfortable with. Um, this is not only true when we're talking about the security situation next door, um, but also because China holds such a big uh, substantial position in the region and just in the world. It's, it's a very different place than how it was if we look back, uh, you know, in 2001, 2002. So this leaves uh, open room for perhaps potential mission creep when we're looking at, you know, Beijing looking to defend its own interests in, the, in its backyard. Um, and I think looking ahead, uh, actually what will be quite crucial relationships for China and interesting areas to watch are going to be its relationships with Iran and Pakistan, especially to, in Afghanistan. Um, because I think while both Tehran and, Tehran and Islamabad have increasingly strong ties with Beijing, uh, both countries, especially Pakistan, are quite cautious and suspicious when it comes to sharing their networks uh, in Afghanistan with China. Um, you know, if we're looking north to the Central Asian states, you know, China is probably going to feel um, there's going to be some push from the Central Asian states who are going to be quite worried um, about spillover from Afghanistan. Um, and that could lead to Beijing playing a more substantial, substantial role. But I do think that that's going to be in diplomatic terms and, you know, in financial terms, whether that's going to be, you know, offering cash um, and investment as a way to incentives to try and stabilize things and perhaps bring the security situation to a more, more uh, calm kind of position. 
But whether that could work and whether the rewards of that are seen as outweighing the risks for Beijing, I think is something that's still very much in the, up in the air. Um, I think it's still kind of in this wait and see mode at the moment. Um, you know, China has a, a larger footprint in Central Asia. It engages with uh, the five states, you know, through its own formats um, and also through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So it does have some kind of interesting tools and, and kind of ways to engage with the broader region. But I think in terms of, of real actual lever, levers to achieve something, um, China's options are actually quite limited. Um, and then there's also the issue of will. Um, and, you know, and then if we talk about the relationship with Russia, well, I think obviously Moscow and Beijing are, are closer in a lot of respects. Um, if we talk about a you know, security or military footprint, I mean that Russia is still seen as the kind of the security kind of leader in Central Asia and in the region more broadly. And I don't think that Beijing has ambition to take that mantle away from Russia. So for the moment, I think that China will continue to hedge in Afghanistan and uh, you know, look to defend its own quite narrow interests that relate back home, especially related to Uyghurs and to Xinjiang. So I'll turn that back over to you guys. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mustafa, why don't you conclude our speakers forum here for a moment? Go ahead. Mustafa? unmute yourself, if you will. There you go. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, the withdrawal of US troops from uh, Afghanistan after uh, 20 years of war uh, poses uh, dangers to uh, Afghanistan and uh, uh, continues to uh, create uh, uh, uncertainty. Um, there are concerns, uh, complexities, uh, uncertainties, and uh, questions, uh, but there are uh, potential opportunities for uh, the region and uh, Afghanistan as well in terms of connectivity and um, economic growth. Uh, many ask what will happen next as the US is on the verge of completing um, the withdrawal process from Afghanistan. One major question is that how do Iran, Russia and China see the US decision to withdraw from Afghanistan? Um, Iran, Russia and China have called for an orderly and responsible withdrawal of the US troops from Afghanistan. Uh, Iran is concerned about the presence of the Sunni radical Islamic State affiliates called the Khorasan uh, province in uh, pockets of Afghanistan. Uh, Russia has fears for a potential spillover of radical Islamic groups from Afghanistan into Central Asian countries. Uh, you know that the withdrawal of uh, US troops from Afghanistan began on May 1st this year. Uh, since then, uh, the Taliban have seized dozens of districts in uh, various parts of uh, uh, the country, including in northern uh, Afghanistan. Concerns in Tajikistan and Russia further grew after the Taliban uh, recently seized Sher Khan Bandar, um, a, a strategic port town situated at the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Uh, just recently, a task quoted Russian Security Council secretary as saying that the situation in Afghanistan is uh, worsening as the US and NATO troops are leaving the country, adding that it would trigger an uptick in activities by Daesh and Al Qaeda in there. Uh, China has also uh, said uh, that it is concerned about uh, the Uyghurs, East Turkestan Islamic movement, whose members are believed uh, to be stationed in some pockets of mountainous northeastern Balakshan uh, bordering China. Uh, a recent Pentagon a long report shows that China has benefited from the uh, security provided by the NATO presence in Afghanistan, adding uh, that the withdrawal removes this uh, benefit and uh, uh, that China will not replace NATO um, as a security guarantor. Uh, so Iran, Russia and China are closely watching the developments in Afghanistan as the US um, is on the verge of completing its pullout from uh, the landlocked um, country after years of uh, war. Uh, I will take a look at the uh, objectives and interests of uh, 
uh, each uh, uh, key stakeholder uh, maybe later, and I leave it uh, at that uh, for the time being. Thank you. Sorry. It strikes me that you all have in common at least two themes here. Uh, the inevitability of the collapse of the Kabul government, perhaps preceded by the breaking up, unraveling of the national security forces, Afghan national security forces. You also, your descriptions are that the countries that we're looking at today are gonna to be taking a containment strategy as, as, their, as, their main, as their main objective. That came through most clearly in Nikita's remarks but you all have that in there. But let's have a little different scenario because by and large, you all are expecting with a fall of the Afghan government, let's, you know, I think we all agree that, that that's a disaster in itself, uh, certainly for the Afghan people. Uh, and you know, let's not forget that we're talking about a, uh, uh, a society which has emerged here 20 years that has some viability, except for the fact that it's been threatened. Uh, but let's take a scenario in which now it's not a transition. Very realistically, that it becomes what people are so fearful of, everyone, a chaotic civil war, where there are many parts uh, Militias fighting militias, elements of the insurgency fighting elements of the insurgency, as well as one another. And it looks much more on, on a grand scale the way uh, the situation looked from 1992 to 1996. Uh, so, but even then, there were, there were basically after that two sides, the Northern Alliance and the others. So, very briefly, uh, could you comment on? In that event, and also in the event that in a chaotic civil war, uh, there will be no economy and there will be millions of refugees, people fleeing for a variety of reasons, economic, but also because they feel that there's going to be retribution for what they have done over the last 20 years. Uh, certainly the more educated, but many beyond that. So in that case, what is the possibility here that the various countries that we're looking at get soaked into this conflict. Uh, and if so, what form would it take? Please. May I? Yes, please start. Start. Thank you. Um, so uh, some uh, anticipate uh, that the withdrawal of uh, US troops from Afghanistan uh, could lead to uh, another bloody uh, civil war. Uh, for instance, the US Congress mandated Afghanistan study group uh, warned in its final report in February this year uh, that uh, an abrupt US withdrawal uh, is likely to intensify the conflict, uh, triggering a wider civil war. Um, as we speak, uh, thousands of people in various parts of Afghanistan uh, including um, in uh, places in, the, in northern Afghanistan, have taken up arms against uh, Taliban fighters. Uh, in uh, the 1990s, uh, uh, as uh, it was mentioned, um, some regional um, stakeholders and players, uh, including Iran, India, uh, Russia and Pakistan were reportedly involved in both the civil war and during the uh, Taliban uh, regime. Um, we recall that each uh, supporting their affiliates and proxies at the local uh, level, uh, so to speak. Now, uh, there is some concern to varying uh, degrees. When we uh, talk to uh, ordinary Afghans in different parts of Afghanistan on a daily basis, uh, men and women, uh, they are concerned about uh, the situation. Um, uh, you know, uh, they have borne the brunt of uh, the uh, long uh, Afghan conflict. 
and they only want uh, one thing, a permanent uh, ceasefire uh, to be able to uh, live in a relative peace and uh, security. Uh, but let's talk about, uh, you know, back to your question, uh, uh, Iran, for example, has supported thousands of uh, Afghan Shiite fighters within the framework of uh, Lashkar-e Fatimun or Fatimun Brigade uh, outside of Afghanistan. We have seen that in Syria. Um, Russia has also been reportedly in contact with non-state actors and powerful uh, local uh, strongmen and power brokers. Um, but, uh, you know, some believe that it's unlikely that Iran, Russia and China uh, will invade Afghanistan uh, militarily um, it, it, after the uh, withdrawal of US and uh, its allies, troops from Afghanistan. They may help different groups in the event of an outbreak of a civil war, uh, but overall, a lot has changed uh, sin, uh, since 1990s, as you know. For example, uh, at that time, uh, we recall that uh, the United States and the international community left Afghanistan high and dry, so to speak. Uh, but uh, now the United States uh, has uh, repeatedly said that it will not leave Afghanistan alone. Uh, a recent uh, White House statement said Washington would continue to support uh, the Afghan people, including women, girls, and minorities. The European Union and uh, NATO um, have said uh, that they will uh, stand by Afghanistan and its people. Washington has uh, time and again said that it wants to make sure that Afghanistan will never again becomes a safe haven for international terrorists. So some ob observers believe that uh, despite uncertainties and complexities and threats, a continued international presence in Afghanistan could mitigate uh, the possibility of uh, another round of uh, civil war uh, in the country. Thank you. Okay, uh, would anybody else want to jump in on let this? Me, uh, let me just uh, add to- Fatima and then Nikita. Sure. Let me add to what uh, Mustafa just said, that, you know, uh, the difference between the uh, uh, gov current government of Afghanistan and, uh, you know, uh, and the situation in the 90s uh, is that back then, you know, the uh, United States, all neighbor, entire world wanted that Soviet backed regime to fall, to collapse. And they really didn't care what would come you know, what would replace that regime. The difference is that right now, no one wants the Afghan government to fall, they, uh, to, to collapse. No one wants the Taliban come to power, you know, uh, violently. And that actually, that's the only thing that gives me hope at this point, honestly. And uh, if we get a chance, you know, uh, we should really, be, we could talk about the importance of, uh, putting aside all differences at this point. It's so crucial uh, right now that the United States and China and Russia and Iran, and that the differences between the United States and Iran doesn't play into Afghanistan, that these issues should be separate, separated, you know, urgently, really, uh, right away. And uh, so the fact that uh, no one wants the, uh, the Taliban to replace uh, current government, not I mean, uh, Pakistan certainly doesn't want, uh, you know, a, 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 the rule of Taliban into Pakistan. So there is literally no other country that wants uh, Taliban in power if they come, if they come to power, you know, uh, uh, through uh, not through negotiations and, and peace talks. And uh, Let's hope for the best, <laughs> but I I don't think you know. Uh, I think it's kind of exaggerated the power of Iran with is with the Fatimiyun uh, brigade. I don't think they are a an army ready to be deployed into Afghanistan, or if you know, or uh, if they were even if they were that Iran would deploy them. First of all, they were in Syria uh, as uh, based on the economic rewards, 
uh, social, you know, uh, uh, rewards in the uh, in terms of residency and and visa and work permit, and some were really convinced that they are defending uh, holy sites of Shias in in Syria. There is no way that those people, those Afghans, are going to stay Iran's army forever, and uh, there is no way that they would fight their own brothers and and uh, uh, Afghan citizens in uh, at the at the uh, rule of of Iran i don't think you know they are or as uh, mosafa just mentioned no country not you know uh, russia china or iran or any other country i don't think there will be deployment into afghanistan iran's by the way just this week uh, yes the day before yesterday they, they they started deploying, uh, you know, uh, troops and and military equipment in the around the border region uh, with Afghanistan. But you know, invading Afghanistan, going into Afghanistan, I don't think that will happen. Uh, Fatima, I was referring more to proxy, not necessarily there. Yeah, uh, because that is the form it took in the in the nineties. Uh, I want to get to our questions so quickly, uh, Nikita. Nikita? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, just a few words. Uh, first of all, uh, Mustafa mentioned uh, uh, the declaration of the White House on the situation in Afghanistan. I'm afraid that this document doesn't cost more than the paper it is printed on, because you can take this declaration and go to Kunduz to discuss it uh, with local people, Talibs, and troops. Uh, it's uh, no sense to talk. Who wants the Taliban to win or to lose? It is winning. Just this time we are sitting here. As I mentioned in uh, my first uh, uh, talk, um, uh, now they're uh, t uh, trying to take uh, Kunduz, the third uh, city in the Afghanistan, uh, of the large, I mean. Uh, uh, Okay, nobody, I mean, uh, the West uh, doesn't want Taliban to win, but nobody is going to do anything uh, to, uh, to make it lose. Uh, I'm afraid that, uh, in fact, United States uh, are absolutely agree to deal with Taliban. First of all, I mean, uh, the so-called peace declaration, which uh, was um, made in Doha. Uh, the, the second step, is that in fact so-called talibs are sons of uh, or younger brothers of so-called mujahids uh, movement which uh, was active in uh, 1980s it was supported by washington it was called freedom fighters but in fact those people were the same terrorists talibans are they were killing people blowing up uh, schools killing uh, teachers and doctors because they just do doesn't w didn't want Afghanistan to be modernized by local communists. Now we, we do have Taliban, which uh, is doing the same things. Uh, and uh, because it doesn't like uh, uh, local Democrats uh, to modernize country on the Western way. Uh, so, it's, it is not going to be a big problem uh, for Washington to support uh, Talibs, to call them uh, freedom fighters if they would attack, um, for example, uh, China or Russia. It is the reason why Russia and China are not going, are not interested to go inside of Afghanistan, because we will uh, see the, the same situation. It was in 1980s. We're trying to help country. We're trying to modernize it. And uh, foreign countries, including NATO members, are going to support terrorist groups uh, as it was with Mujahids. Uh, I'm sorry uh, for taking more time. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, look, we have uh, a few questions here. And uh, let me see what uh, Christopher McIntosh uh, really has basically asked his question. Um, is there anything possible now on the on the peace front, on the negotiation front? Or are we all just simply dismissing that now as at best a sideshow? 
Would any quickly anybody's thoughts on this? No, um, I can jump in there. Very, really yeah. Yeah. No is probably the, the quickest answer to that question. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, given the activity that's happening in the country right now, I mean, we saw some big pushes that's happening, you know, earlier in this year to try and bring some kind of a, a resolution or to get some kind of diplomatic uh, momentum going. But I think with the way things are so fluid and changing on the ground that I think that, you know, the ideas of uh, negotiating some kind of peace are are gone. Like, I think that, that that's expired. I, I still have some hope. I mean, I uh, think in the... Uh, in his trip to Washington, President Ghani is going to be under some pressure, you know, to really sit down and 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 take the initiative a little more serious. Uh, I think there are still voices of reason in Afghanistan that can mediate, and I truly believe a regional involvement should be in, should be implemented immediately. You know, I mean, uh, a, 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 some kind of regional peacekeeping force that I mentioned. I mean, they really should get in touch, in close touch and direct touch with the Taliban and with the uh, Afghan government. And uh, no, I still have some hope. Let's see what comes out of the uh, President Ghani's to Washington. Very interesting. Fatima, of course, we also have to consider the possibilities that the Taliban now see victory clearly within their sight, and there's no need to deal with uh, these uh, other uh, other voices, uh, uh, and that uh, there's no indication that you could get that kind of coordination among all these countries. Sure, a lot of time has been lost, that's yeah. true. But and finally, that uh, even if they do, everything we've seen of the Taliban is they hear only what they want to hear. Sure. Uh, they'll take yes. assistance, but they're not going to let assistance be the bait here for their uh, falling in line with what others want. Now, we have a question from Doug Brooks, which has been largely answered, but because uh, he asked about, you know, is any country really going to go to bat for, uh, that's an expression, Nikita, <laughs> you may not be familiar with, but uh, are really, are really going to go all out to save this regime. The United States, you know, even the United States is not doing everything it could do. It, or or will this, is this just verbiage at this point? You know, come in and, and really make a difference to enable the security forces to survive and, and to bring the kind of whatever other kind of uh, uh, resources they have. I'm sorry, but I can discuss only the things we actually can see and do have now. Uh, now we have the situation that uh, the government is losing, and Washington did nothing uh, uh, real to help it. Uh, you mentioned the declaration, but declaration would help government troops uh, to keep Kunduz, to keep Kabul. So it means that we are going to see uh, what we discussed before. Uh, the fall of the Kabul, the split of the country, the big crisis. I'm oh. sorry, but it's fact. Yeah, uh, if I may, uh, despite, uh, you know, the uh, uncertainties and complexities and bleak outlook uh, for Afghanistan and uh, the region, um, the US and the international community uh, in terms of their messaging, they're, they're saying that they're not going to leave Afghanistan. And some observers in Afghanistan believe that it sends a powerful message uh, to uh, Afghanistan and also uh, to uh, the region and the people of Afghanistan. Uh, at the regional uh, level uh, that we are talking about Iran, um, China and Russia's role, uh, we have already witnessed some regrouping at the uh, regional uh, level uh, recently. For instance, uh, the expanded Troika group in which representatives of the United States, Russia, China and Pakistan, Qatar and Turkey, they participated in Moscow in March and they discussed Afghanistan. Uh, you know, uh, many of the participants, uh, all of them, uh, you know, uh, said that they do not want a restoration of uh, 
uh, the Islamic Emirate of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, you know that uh, that that uh, sends a message uh, that uh, mm, uh, they uh, want, uh, you know, just uh, um, uh, in terms of their uh, vested national interests, uh, they have concerns about security. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Iran, Russia and China want to protect their interests through partnership and uh, alignment, despite their rivalry, some say. Some observers say that the withdrawal of, uh, uh, you know, uh, US troops from Afghanistan will create uh, a security vacuum in uh, the country and uh, region. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, um, some say that Iran, China and Russia might try to exploit the situation to avoid any untoward outcome, such as another bloody civil war in Afghanistan. So uh, Pakistan, Iran, China and uh, mm, uh, Russia, uh, at least on paper, uh, so to speak, they have said that they uh, want stability and uh, security in Afghanistan uh, rather than uh, an Afghanistan plunged into, uh, you know, a simmering political situation or um, another civil war. Thank you. Yeah, Mustafa, that certainly is the hope and the hope of, uh, I think, uh, most of the international community. But the question is, what instruments do they have to bring about that kind of outcome? Uh, if, as I say, the Taliban are, are, are determined here to take uh, control. And, and I would introduce this idea, and it goes back to something that Kita said earlier, and that is if the Taliban are able to consolidate power, isn't it very likely then that most of these countries will want to have some kind of modus vivendi with this country? And if only because it is for containment, to say in effect that in exchange for our giving you some assistance or, or not interfering with you, we want some assurances that you're not going to export radical Islam. Uh, personally, I see that as, as, a, as a very plausible outcome here. And I think, uh, I think this is what Nikita was, was getting at. Um, uh, we have time for very, very briefly here, a, a, a question uh, bringing in Saudi Arabia, but I think that from Leah Obamaya, uh, but I think that's probably outside of our of our uh, uh, comfort zone here. Uh, but it does remind us of the fact that Saudi Arabia and India are going to be very much part of this kind of chemistry, which is going to, you know, figure in what happens in the future. Uh, and uh, Benjamin Tua. Uh, raises the question about uh, ISIS or, or preferably Islamic State ISK or, or called Daesh, if you will. I wish we would agree on terminology. Um, uh, and Al Qaeda, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of assuming that ultimately they get subsumed under this. But is that, it's one thing to strike your deal with deals with. Uh, with the uh, Kabul government uh, under Taliban control. It may be another thing if you still have a strong Daesh force out there, uh, which matters. So uh, I think that reminds me, uh, reminds all of us of, uh, of how much more complex this is than we, uh, than we are accustomed to dealing with, even with Afghanistan. Uh, we're about out of time, uh, but I, I want to thank our viewers for, for some questions and uh, also uh, especially our, our panelists. This has been, a, I think, a very edifying panel. I hope our viewing audience agrees with me that uh, it was worth the hour that we've spent this morning. And, uh, uh, and I, wanted that, I want to mention also that, which I should have at the beginning, this is sponsored by both MAI and Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty. Uh, this is a joint venture, and uh, I hope perhaps we'll do some other kinds of uh, activities together in the future. And but for now, uh, let's sign off, and uh, we'll say Bamana <laughs> Choda. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.